The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For well, that means life to you and the length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. And Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 139. <clears throat> o Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark out my journeys and my resting place. And I'm acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high that I cannot attain it. For you yourself created my inmost parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you for I am faithfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, my soul knows well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my form as yet unfinished. Already in your book were all my members written. As day by day they were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How deep are your counsels to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I count them, they are more in number than the sand. And at the end, I am still in your presence. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Now we have our New Testament reading from Philemon.
The New Testament reading is taken from Philemon uh, verses, uh, chapters, verses 1 to 7. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apia, our sister, to Archelaus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to us and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in our prayers, I always thank, thank God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel reading. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he will send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Being alive is all about having choices. It's all about the ability to make choices, to choose. In our Old Testament passage, Moses challenges the children of Israel and says to them, choose life. In our Gospel reading, Jesus talks about choosing and then asks his disciples and those who are following him, to count the cost. For choices always come with a cost. There's always a different outcome depending what you choose. Even if it's something as simple as choosing which flavor of ice cream. If you choose lemon, you can't have vanilla. And if you choose vanilla, you can't have lemon. There's a cost. And of course, bigger choices have bigger costs. Jesus passage this morning, his words this morning, really resonated very strongly with me. He was talking about building a tower and counting the cost before you start to build. Well, of course, as a church here a few months ago, we were thinking about building our own building. But we had to count the cost before we started building, and we decided it wasn't the right time. And I think that was the right decision to make. But it's a part of wisdom. We have choices to make, and we have to choose the right thing. Now, as some of you will know, I'm right in the middle of making a big decision. My house in Manchester, which I've had for over nearly, yeah, nearly 20 years, the tenants have left and it's now got vacant possession. 
Meanwhile, I've seen a beautiful apartment overlooking the sea in a seaside town called Scarborough, which those of you from the UK will know of and some others may have heard of. I could sell the house in Manchester and buy the apartment in Scarborough. It may even mean that I can pay off the rest of my mortgage and then have income from that without having to have paying out the mortgage. But of course, it's a big decision. That's really the only savings I have and that would help, hopefully, to provide for my retirement the income from the rent. Counting the cost, I have to make the right decision. I think, probably purely rationally, it would be best just to stay where things are. To leave them as they are because it's a good house and it's got a good income and it's, it's gone on for 20 years nearly. But what is the right thing to do? I can do due diligence. I can do all the research I need to do on house prices and apartment prices and rental incomes and likelihood of renting and all that. But in the end, so often our choices come down to a gut feeling, down to our intuition, down to that, perhaps we could say that voice of God, of knowing that something is the right move or really is not the right thing to do. I've shared with you before, I think, about when I went to Spain and I was there for four years and I don't think that was ever really the right decision. Logically, it seemed the good thing to do. Yes, it's not too far away from the UK, only an hour or so's flight, all the things I could need, but the sun shining and a nice place to live. But I don't think it was ever really God's plan for me to be there and I had some good times, but I also had some quite difficult times when I was there. But sometimes it's very difficult to choose. And we can easily take the wrong path, although it, it bends around. God pulls us back and God uses us wherever we are. But Jesus asked his disciples to count the cost. He asked them to choose, but not do it forethoughtlessly. Not do it just on the spur of the moment, but to think about what the cost would be. Moses was doing the same. Moses was asking the people to choose prosperity, to choose life. Now, of course, that was only his argument. There were probably people arguing on the opposite side, saying, no, don't choose what he's saying. That's going to be a disaster. This fool's led you for 40 years in circle in the wilderness. Is this the person whose advice you should take? We always get history from the view of the winners. And so the account we get of Moses talking about choose life and prosperity, that's the account that Moses wrote. He didn't write down what the other people were saying. Decisions are not always as easy. Of course, if there's a choice between life and prosperity or death and adversity, what would you choose? Life and prosperity or death and adversity? Who's going to vote for death? Not many people. But of course, that's only what Moses was saying. And it very often comes down to, do we believe what is being said to us? As I said, being alive and, and true life is about choice. It's about being able to choose. I think that's one of the things that marks slavery out. And there's a lot in Scripture about being a slave to sin or being a slave to our feelings or, or being free in Christ. For slavery isn't so much about being poor. For many people are poor. It's not so much being treated harshly for many people who are not slaves and just working in an ordinary job are treated very badly. Many people who are in an ordinary job have barely enough to eat and barely enough to make things through the next week. They might be better off in terms of food and accommodation if they were a slave. But slavery is about no choice. It's about being compelled to do something whether you want to or not. Someone could be working as a prostitute voluntarily and, and like the extra money and be doing it. But if someone is in slavery as a sex object and taken in that, then that maybe is one of the worst things they could do for they have no choice. Someone could be working as a cook as their job and love being a cook. And that could be what they really feel their life's calling is. But if someone is a slave and is forced to work as a cook, it may not be a bad job, but they have no choice. So they are in slavery. There is no choice when someone is a slave. But being alive is about choice. That's one of the questions that comes up again and again in Christian theology, is the question of evil. And why does God allow evil in the world? 
But if we didn't have a choice, then no one could choose evil, but then no one could choose good either. For we'd just be forced to do whatever God wanted us to do. Choosing is about being alive. That's why people campaign so much for, for rights to choose what they want to do. That's why LGBT rights are campaigned for, because people want to choose who they can love or choose who they can be and choose what they feel they should do. Choice is at the center of the Christian faith and the Christian gospel because God offers us each a choice. We can get up in the morning, especially if you're retired, all those people who are retired can get up in the morning and choose what to do for the day. What am I going to do today? That's not always a good choice because you can maybe not think of what to do that day. But it's a choice. It means you're alive. As I said in the Old Testament, Moses offered a choice between life and death, prosperity and adversity. But life is not always quite so clear. It's not always difficult, or not always easy, I should say, to know who to believe. The biggest choice that's happened to my country in the last 40 years has been to choose to leave the EU, as you'll all have heard on the news. And people have said we're going to leave, and people have said we're not going to leave. And it's all about making a choice. But it's who do you believe? And there's been something, a lot of people have said it's going to be a disaster if we leave. And then others have said, no, that's just project fear. It's just people telling you it's going to be a disaster, but it's not really. It's all about choice and what you believe. We certainly need lots of prayer, so if you're British, please pray, and if you're anything else, please pray too, because we need a lot of prayer. Choices are difficult to make. Choices can be very difficult to make. So how do we decide? How do we know what to do? Logic is a good way of starting. When I'm looking, as I say, at, at buying this apartment in Scarborough, I'm looking at the logic and weighing up the pros and the cons, the costs the, and everything else. But it can only take us so far. We can listen to advice, we can talk to people we think are wise, but that can still only take us so far. We have to do in the end what feels right. Our, follow our intuition. In a way, we should say we listen to God. For God speaks in those ways, through the feelings, through the intuition. When I first came to a strong Christian faith when I was around age 14, the people who were teaching me were quite conservative, quite, I guess you could say, fundamentalist. And one of the things they said was, don't follow your feelings. Follow facts. The Bible says this, this is what you should do. Even if it feels wrong, that's just your feelings, and your feelings should be based on facts. Well, of course, what I didn't realize was, was those facts were what they were saying, and that wasn't necessarily the right thing either. We have to rely on our feelings, for that is how God guides us. And sometimes we can be wrong, of course, but in the end, we have to step out in faith. So, we follow the teachings of the Bible. You'd think any book which was trying to recruit followers would say it's easy. It would say Jesus wanted disciples. So he would say, come follow me. Lots of free food, lots of everything you want. Feed the 5,000, walk on the water, take a shortcut on the way home. But he didn't. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. He said, count the cost. He said those very strange words which we read this morning about hating your mother and father, your husband, your wife, your pa What was he talking about? As I said a few weeks ago, we like to look at the Jesus who came to bring peace on the earth, but he also said that he came to bring a sword. And it's not the sort of idea we really readily accept or understand. But I think what Jesus was saying was that there will be choices to be made. And that if you want to choose to follow God, then there sometimes will be quite hard choices. Sometimes it won't go the way we would like to do and would be the easy way for us to take. But sometimes taking a stand may mean losing our families, losing our friends, losing everything because we have to stand for what we believe. We're called upon to count the cost. 
Our gospel ends with that very challenging passage where Jesus says, if anyone would like to become my disciple, if you do not give up your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. So am I totally failing on this because I'm not giving up my possessions. I'm buying another one. What is Jesus saying? Well, I don't think he's telling us, each one of us, to give up everything now. But we have to hold on to our possessions very lightly. For at any time, we could be told to give them away. And if we try to hold on, the, the tighter we hold on to what we own, the tighter what we own holds on to us. And we can become that slave even as we're supposed to be set free in Christ. As I said to you before, I had a beautiful house in Spain, one and a half acres of, of land covered in 250 orange trees, a swimming pool, views over the mountains. It was beautiful. But I realized that if I wanted to maintain those orange trees, I would have to spend every day of my life looking after my possessions, pruning and cutting and that would be my life, would be to take care of my possessions. That's not freedom. For freedom is, if, we ho if we're holding so tightly to what we own that it holds on to us, we have no freedom at all. But we're called to count the cost. God offers us a choice. And it's always about choosing one way or the other. Sometimes it's not clear. Sometimes it doesn't even matter. Sometimes when we're given a free choice, yes, we can have this or this. Actually, God doesn't mind which. It's not always that we're going to be guided by we must have Mexican food or Indian food tonight and we need to pray about it first. And even on some of the bigger decisions, where we live, what we do, that may just be a free choice and God isn't saying do this or do that. Both are good paths. But at other times... We have to pray and listen and use our intuition, our gut feeling, and say, what are you telling me to do, God? Where are you leading me? In our liturgy, a little later, we will talk about Jesus having us set us free from slavery. And that is very, very true. For slavery is so much what the world offers. Can you imagine people advertising on TV become a slave? But that's what they're advertising. They're saying, buy this new sofa and you can pay it over the next 25 years. Buy this new car and you can pay it over the next 70 years. They're actually talking about mortgages in England now, not 25 years, not 50 years, but actually 100 year mortgages because the houses are so expensive. What they expect is that when you die, you'll hand it on to the children and they will keep paying the debt. Or when you die, the house can be sold and the remaining amount owed can then be paid back to the bank. So your whole life you will be working to pay money to keep and pay for your possessions. Jesus promises to set us free from slavery. Sometimes that means having less, living more simply, but always it means choosing to do things in God's way. So God is setting before us this week a choice in everything we do. And as Moses said, we can choose life and prosperity or death and adversity. No one wants to choose the latter. But sometimes we do it almost by accident. But let's follow the way of Jesus, which is loving one another, loving those around us, not holding on to our possessions, but being free to live and love and choose life. Amen.